Thank you for tuning in to the Postmodern Realities Podcast, brought to you by the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. I'm Melanie Cogdell, Managing Editor of the Christian Research Journal. It's November 2023, and you're listening to episode 367, which is a conversation about just war theory. On this episode, I'm joined by Bob Perry, who has an MA in Christian Apologetics from Biola University. He is a speaker, teacher, writer, and retired aviator. He blogs at TrueHorizon.org. Bob has written an article for the online edition of the Christian Research Journal. His article is called Just War 5.0 on the Evolution and Application of Just War Doctrine in the Modern World. And you can read his article for free at our website, Equip.org. Bob, it's good to have you on again. Yeah, it's good to be here. It's been a while. It has. Well, today we are talking about something called just war theory and Christian ethics. And before we get into it, I'm sure our listeners might be wondering about this issue because of two well-known wars going on right now in the world. And that is the Ukrainian war that started back in February of 2022 when Russia entered Ukraine. And then also more recently, in October 2023 in the Middle East, we now have the war going on in Gaza with Hamas and the Israelis after Hamas kidnapped and brutally murdered some Israeli and other citizens. And so that kind of was compared to maybe Israel's 9-11 or something along those lines. And so there's two conflicts, and I'm sure there's others not as well publicized, that are going on right now. But before we start at all, I want to ask you about this topic just generally. I mean, one of the things that you wrote in your article, you wrote this quote, neither war hawks nor pacifists should be comfortable within the Christian worldview. And I think that's fascinating because I think when most Christians think of war, they think in those terms. You're either kind of on the hawkish side or you believe war is completely immoral. There's only two choices. So why do you think Christians and Christian apologists should even spend time thinking about what it means to have a Christian view or an ethical view about warfare at all, considering how you know violent war is? It's, it's horrible. Well, I, I agree with you there. It is a fascinating thing because we, as you know, most of us will never be in a position to make decisions about going to war, but we're electing people who do. And I think we need to be able to understand what just war theory is and to hold them accountable to that. Um, for me, this is personal. I, I, I spent eight years in the U.S. Marine Corps a long time ago. So, I mean, it's not as personal now for, the, for that reason. But I also have five sons who are uh, up until recently active duty military. Two of them just got out in the last year, but I still have three in who are in warfare specialties that puts them right at the tip of the spear. I won't go into it more than that, but that, so this is personal. I don't want my sons to go to war. I want our leaders to avoid that at all costs. Well, I shouldn't say that, not at all costs. I want them to avoid it as much as it can be avoided. Um, but I understand that, you know, they signed up to serve and that's part of what it means to serve is that you are ready to do that if you need to. So I want our leaders to make wise, uh, ethical decisions about when this country goes to war, um, because it, it is personal. I, I, I would prefer that it not happen, but if it does, we need to be ready. And sometimes being ready is the best deterrent to actually having to go to war. So let's talk about this particular uh, issue, and I want you to defend it and also and give us some just information about how we should consider this term at all, just war. And I'm just speaking to our listeners. You probably have listeners from all over the globe, maybe, but we're specifically, when we talk about electing our officials, we're here in the United States. So that's what we're referring to. So our government has a specific way in which they would 
authorized engagement in war. But before we get into details, can you please give us a brief introduction to what you mean by just war? I mean, that I think to some people that sounds like an oxymoron. How could there be a just war? Right. I, I agree. And that's part of the problem with just war. It, it's it's been misused over the over the years and it's it is it is does seem like an oxymoron but let, let me just put it um give you an analogy if you were walking down the street and just wanted to just go punch someone in the face that is not ethical that's not moral and no one would defend that but um if someone came up and punched you in the face would you have the right i guess uh, is the best word the the would you be just in defending yourself or if you saw someone else being attacked, would you be justified in tr- helping them defend myself? That that's what just war theory is like. That I mean, that's a a, a mini uh, kind of example of what just war theory is. Are there reasons that it's okay uh, on a Christian ethic to enter into a war? And I would contend that there are. In fact, I would contend that there are some instances where it would be unjust and unethical not to enter. So, you know, I gave you that quote earlier that you wrote that you think that both hawks and pacifists would really be uncomfortable with a a true Christian view of, of, of just war. So, you know, it's maybe it's not obvious, but should Christians always be hawks? I mean, some of the things is like, how do we separate some of this from what happens to end up being political policy and thinking Christianly about this topic. And of course, Jesus himself taught us not to repay evil for evil and to turn the other cheek, or if someone takes something from you, you give him your coat as as well. So how can Christians take that teaching that Christ said and then also talk about that there are instances in which We could say that war is moral, like you said, that there is a situation perhaps in which a country would defend themselves. Right. Um, And and that's where my the analogy I used before about walking down the street breaks down, because on a personal level, we are supposed to turn the other cheek. And, you know, we're supposed to love people first. And love doesn't seem to include going to war. But let, let me just look at it this way. In Luke 6 and Matthew 5. Those are the, the passages where it talks about where Jesus says, if someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other cheek also. And Bible scholars through the years have looked at that and said, you know, to it, he specifically says the right cheek. Well, most people are right handed, which would mean that to hit someone on the right cheek, you would be a backhanded slap, which in that culture was a sign of disrespect. It was an insult. So scholars have argued that this is a personal prohibition about returning insult for insult on a personal level. Um, Maybe you agree with that, maybe you don't. But in Romans 13, Paul is very specific in making the case that God has established the institution of government as a means to protect people and administer punishment to wrongdoers. In uh, Romans 13, I'll just quote this. Uh, It says, everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has in- instituted and those who will bring judgment upon themselves. For he is God's servant to do good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment to the wrongdoer. So the the idea here is it takes it from a personal level to an institutional level, that the institution of government is what God has established to bring justice in the world. Um, And I guess just as an example, I think when I said earlier that uh, I think there can be times where it's immoral not to go to war, uh, in World War II, the things that Hitler was doing, trying to exterminate the Jews um, or Other, you know, that's that's the most common example people go to. But genocide of any kind, if we see that going on in the world, I think as Christians, it's it's our moral responsibility to stand up and help people in a situation like that. And that's one of the reasons that governments are instituted. Now, it gets tricky 
when we'd have conflict between governments and non-government entities, and that's kind of what this article is about. So I want to give people a little bit of maybe historical background or just some information of like, we're not just here modern warfare. I mean, warfare is a very old, I mean, back in the Bible, we read uh, many instances where the Israelites fought war. So where is the concept of just war that we think of when we think of just war theory? Where, uh, where does that originate? And who came up with that phrase or the idea of just war? Well, yeah, the uh, ancient times, uh, the, the Egyptians actually talked about it in, the, uh, you know, well before Christ, about the criteria of when they would wage war, but they were talking on behalf of their gods. Um, the Greeks had arguments about where and how to fight, and it was Aristotle who first introduced the concept and terminology in the Hel Hellenic world about just war as a last resort. Um, in his book, Politics, Aristotle argues that the cultivation of a military is necessary and good for the purpose of self-defense. The proper object of practicing military training is not in order that men may enslave those who they do not, do not deserve slavery, but in order that they may themselves avoid becoming enslaved by others. So Aristotle talked about it philosophically, and as you said, there are biblical accounts of the Israelites going to war. But it was in like the fourth century, St. Augustine first started talking about this um, as a Christian. That's where it ended the Christian debate and became more refined in the Middle Ages, specifically by Thomas Aquinas. Um, so it's, it's, it's not something new. It's not something we just came up with in the modern world to kind of justify what we were doing. There's a long tradition in history of Christians talking about um, just war issues. As you may know, paid subscriptions to the Christian Research Journal are a thing of the past. We don't have them anymore. In addition, we don't even have a paywall. All the journal articles that are new that come out each week are completely free on our website, equip.org. You don't even need to log in with a free account. They're just free. You can just click on any of the titles to read them. We would like you, though, to consider supporting us in the two following ways. One is just a gift of your time to rate or review this podcast on Apple Podcasts. It helps us with the algorithm, which is kind of how the internet works. And the more ratings and reviews that we have, the more that our podcast will be suggested to people who are looking for podcasts on Christian apologetics and Christian discernment and Christian ethics and Christian living. So in any of those categories, people are looking for new material to listen to and your help with the algorithm would make that possible. In addition, you can become a partner with us by giving a donation to the ongoing work of the Christian Research Journal. Just go to equip.org. If you scroll down, you will see that there are some featured resources for your gift and your donation. You will see a graphic that has four books on it that are by authors that have been featured recently on this podcast, including longtime author Douglas Grotheis, who has a new book out called World Religions in Seven Sentences. We have two selections from Mama Bear Apologetics, and Hillary Morgan Ferrer of Mama Bear Apologetics was recently on talking about the Barbie movie. Plus, back in September, I talked to the authors of the book Responding to the Mormon Missionary Message. So you won't want to miss out on any of those, and you can give us a gift of 25 for any one of those, 50 for any two, or for all of them. You can also give us a gift, and those donation amount choices are at the landing page for those resources if you click that graphic. Now, why would you get these from us versus from Amazon or Barnes & Noble or somewhere else where you might be able to get it at a cheaper price? It's because when you give us a gift, you are also helping to support this work as opposed to supporting those online retailers. So we are grateful that you would consider supporting and partnering with us from time to time so that we can continue to bring you this free podcast and the articles for free. We still think that our authors are worth the research and time and they put into writing for us. And so we pay them. Yes, we do. We pay our authors. And I don't think that's true for all the online sites where people write, but we do pay our authors. We think it's worth it. And this will help us with our budget. Well, thank you for your consideration. And now back to this very fascinating conversation about the nature of war with today's guest, Bob Perry.
So I want to ask you about just in general, how do nations decide when it is acceptable to go to war? I mean, what are the kinds of criteria do they use? And can you just kind of review for us what some of the tenets of just war are so that people can familiarize themselves with it? Sure. Um, there's basically three categories of ju- of criteria for just war. And these come from, uh, their, their three categories are from Latin terms, jus ad bellum, which is the uses is, is J-U-S to us. So that's where the word just comes from. Just, it's just causes to go to war. Then there's jus in bello, which is just actions inside a war, during the war. And then there's jus post bellum, which is kind of a newer concept about what happens after the war to keep, to make that you're morally responsible with that. So in the use ad bellum, that's the, the reasons to go to war. The, the primary one is that it's a legitimate authority, that there's a, when, when Aquinas and Augustine were talking about this, they were talking about nation states who would have conflicts with each other and that you, you couldn't just go out on your own and start a war. It was, it was, had to be a decision made by a national authority um, the cause had to be just. It couldn't just be aggression or it couldn't just be, uh, you know, we want your lance, so we're going to take it. There had to be um, uh, an, um, an element of protecting the innocent or, or protecting your own people from being attacked. Um, the war had to have a right intention was another criteria. Um, the, it had to advance good and evil, have clear aims and be open to negotiation um, it was never just to be for revenge or for the sake of killing. It had to be waged without a level of violence or cruelty, um, and it was in a pursuit of a just cause. One more criteria for use ad bellum was last resort. In other words, you, you don't just go to war because you're angry about something that happened. You have There's negotiations, diplomacy, talking through these issues of, that you may have differences about. All that has to go first. You War is the last option, in other words. Um, and you have to have a reasonable chance of success. You can't have uh, some, you know, tiny little country can't declare a war on some superpower and, and knowing that their their own people are going to be slaughtered if they do something like that. So there had to be a reasonable chance of success. And then in, in the use in Bello, the conduct during a war it's mainly about discrimination that you do not target civilians. Civilians, uh, women, children, elderly people, those cannot be the primary targets in a war. And we've seen throughout history where the people or nations who are uh, subscribing to Just War Three will go out of their way to try to protect civilians. The second criteria in, in the uh, use in Bello is proportionality. That you don't, you know, if someone shoots somebody across a border, say, you don't nuke that country. The the the, reta- the response has to be in proportion to the attack that you received, if, if that was the case. And then the use post bellum uh, is something that we as, as Americans have been seen firsthand is what do you do after the war? How do you conduct yourselves in, to a, a moral high ground? After the war has ended, how do you keep the peace? Is there a plan in your in your battle plan or whatever for if you decide to go to war about how the war is going to end? How where what are the measures that you're going to take to protect people and keep the peace? Because the ultimate goal of just war theory is that we want to get back to peace. That's the ultimate goal. Well, it's interesting you started that saying uh, that even Egyptians way before Christ had thought about this issue when they thought about going to war. And in your article, you also talk about how war itself has evolved over history. And what do you mean by that? Because I think there are different cultures that would probably look at war in different ways or different religions might look at war in different ways. At the Christian Research Journal, we have done an article on jihad when we consider Islam and when we look at the particular circumstances in which the current Gaza war was started, that was done by an Islamic group that has a particular view of war. So I don't know that every 
entity or group coming to war has similar you know, worldviews or how they would view war, it might be viewed very different in different cultures. Yeah, it, it is. And that's that's part of the problem in, in applying just war theory to the conflicts that we see. Because it's, I mean, I, I don't think many reasonable people would disagree with, I mean, even a pacifist, would, if they acknowledge that people were going to war, would agree with the criteria that I had just laid out about if you're going to do it, you you better have good reasons. You better protect civilians. You better have a, a just cause, you know, all, all that stuff. Um, the What's happened, though, over history is that the, the nature of warfare itself has changed. So um, in the article, I go into what they now label, uh, the, the people who study this closely, label as what we're in now is called fifth generation warfare. And what that means is that we've progressed from the time, you know, when Augustine or Aquinas or, you know, the Egyptians or the Greeks were talking about warfare. They were thinking about nation states who got in conflict with each other, say over a border or something. And at that time it was hand-to-hand combat, you know, with handheld weapons and shields and spears. And that was, that was first generation warfare. Second generation warfare came after the Industrial Revolution, where now we had automatic weapons, machine guns, Gatling guns, and you could you could inflict harm at a distance, still within sight of each other, but that was second generation warfare. Third generation warfare is the kind of stuff that start, we started to see in the 20th century in World War I and II, where we had mechanized infantry, uh, troops who could ride on, um, you know, mechanized equipment or tanks where maneuver warfare became a thing. And you could cover the same amount of ground in a few minutes that under first and second generation warfare may have taken weeks or months to cover. Now you had fast moving warfare. So there was, that brought different kinds of issues into the conflict about how you conduct a war like that. Fourth generation warfare is something that we started to see. I mean, all there, there, it's not like these different generations of war. There was a beginning and end to each. There's still first generation warfare, but these kind of gradually emerged throughout history to the the fourth generation warfare is what you might call guerrilla warfare, which we saw in Vietnam, where small groups of um, troops would attack and then disappear. And they would inflict lots of casualties. There'd be, you know, booby traps, um, landmines, that kind of stuff, where, where the enemy was... And the, the difficult thing with just war theory here is that the enemy becomes difficult to identify. You're not fighting just against another army, say. You're, now you're fighting against people who may not even wear uniforms. They vanish into the jungle after they attack. And that continued, you know, the terror attacks that we've seen in the 20th and 21st century are examples of fourth generation warfare where you're fighting. And this is an article I wrote back in uh, several years ago about drones, that kind of stuff where you're using, it's kind of a guerrilla warfare where it's a small a unit is attacking a larger unit or vice versa. And it's hard to identify the enemy. Fifth generation warfare has made it even worse. Today, we have warfare going on that is as a matter of information and perception. And they, they call, we can get into this a little bit more in detail, but it's, it's war where you may not even realize you're at war. And I, I think part of the issue with what's going on in the modern world here today is that just that, and we're gonna I, I, we, we're gonna talk about some of that in, the, in a few minutes here. But the the idea that you can be at war with somebody and not even realize it is something that's brand new, that's never been, uh, and we've never experienced in history before, and it brings a whole new level of difficulty to applying just war theory to something like that. Bob was mentioning an article that he wrote for us back in 2015. So it's been almost 10 years since that. And it's called Justice and Asymmetric Warfare. If you want to look that up on our website, equip.org. But that is very interesting because things that I don't even know if maybe 10 years ago, we would have thought that war could be also fought online in terms of crippling different countries based on just warfare that is technological in nature that is different 
than we thought of before, but that also has to be part of the equation. So I find this very interesting. I want to ask you a little bit more about fifth generation warfare, because it does seem like that it's not what we think of, like you were explaining in the history of warfare, where people had spears and bows and arrows and then guns. Although even when things got were mechanized, um, thinking back in World War I, I don't know that much about war, but just, you know, the, what little I know from a few, after I see movies about wars, I usually go Wikipedia it up to find out more. But just the idea of everything that was going on in World War I and people were in the trenches and yes, tanks were introduced, but even though they had all these mechanical things, they were still pretty much fighting it in a gruesome way on ground and didn't make that much progress over a number of years and yet a lot of deaths. So it is fascinating to see where everything is now. So kind of unpack a little bit more for us what fifth generation warfare would be like. Because I think when you say war, people usually just conjure up these ideas of, you know, tanks and bombs and maybe even drones now. Right. Yeah. Fifth generation warfare is something I just started learning about in the last few years. Um, when I when the Ukraine war started, I started reading about it and uh, following up, watched some several documentaries by people who have been in military intelligence who talk about these kind of things. And they talk about fifth generation warfare is, they call it a war of information and perception that it's not a new form of fighting that emerged from these other forms. It's not like we went from hand-to-hand -hand combat to mechanized to maneuver warfare to guerrilla warfare, and now we're in this fifth generation. This fifth generation kind of warfare is embedded in all the other different forms of warfare. And, and I'll just read a quote from someone who um, is an expert in this. He says, we are no longer fighting a defined adversary in a defined battle space for a defined period of time. Instead, the fifth generation mission space is a continuous global battle of narratives that will play out over both the virtual and physical space and encompass a range of violent and nonviolent actions and efforts. So we're talking about remote warfare, like with drones. We're talking about cyber warfare on computers. We're talking about psychological warfare where you, um, the enemy can actually inject ideas into your culture that can, um, you know, as a means of taking the culture down to, to rot it from within. We're talking about drugs. We're talking about social media. Um, all these things are, are things that are part of fifth generation warfare that most of it actually civilians are actually involved in. And a lot of times they don't even realize that they are. It's a completely new world out there with, when it comes to fifth generation warfare. You just said drugs. When you talked about fifth generation warfare, what would drugs have anything to do with warfare at all? Well, we mentioned the article I wrote last time about the, uh, that was mainly about fourth turning into fifth generation warfare with drones. So you had this idea that somebody could be, and back then it was mainly one place, Creech Air Force Base, just outside of Las Vegas, Nevada. A, a, Air Force lieutenant could go into a building in, at Creech Air Force Base and direct a drone to kill uh, someone on the other side of the world um, brutally and then walk back, get in his car and go home for dinner. This was a, this was a different kind of uh, warfare that, than we'd ever experienced before. And it wasn't the kind of warfare that the just war theory was built up for. When I, when I, as I said at the beginning, just war theory was created for nation states to be at war. And here we have people who can attack someone on the other side of the world with no real threat of being harmed themselves. So that brings a whole new element into what I would call contactless killing, where you can kill, you know, in, in the old, older forms of warfare, you could be in a battle and, you know, you were a danger yourself. Everybody was getting shot at and there were, you know, even in modern, there were surface missiles that could be shot at tanks and you could be in in the line of that it could be very dangerous for you but in this modern kind of warfare you can actually have no harm that could come to you while you're waging war and and my fear with that is when it comes to just war theory is that we have a, the lieutenants 
in the Air Force who were making those decisions with drones back, you know, 10 years ago. Now they're becoming generals and maybe in some cases politicians. So they've been at war with no threat to bodily harm for themselves. And now they're making decisions for other people to go to war. And I think that's a huge liability to what just war theory is about because you have people who don't know the consequences. They've never had to experience the consequences of war and they're making decisions to send other people to do that kind of thing. So when I talk about fifth generation warfare, that's one of the things that I think is a huge factor that we have to consider. Well, you mentioned now that we're in fifth generation warfare that the way that war is being waged might be different. You even mentioned social media. But the morality of why we engage in war hasn't changed. And so for our listeners, they might be thinking, okay, you're telling me the details of war, but what about a Christian ethic applied to this? Can you tell us a little bit more about really unpacking the morality of even engaging in war at all? Because there are Christians, as you mentioned at the very beginning of your article, that are pacifists, and they don't even see, and especially as you've described some of these things, why would we want to, as a nation, invest in a war and go to war when it seems, you know, a terrible thing to do? Yeah. And I, I'm sorry, Melly. You, I, I realize I got kind of sidetracked on the fifth generation warfare thing, and I, I don't think I actually answered your question. You brought up drugs, because I put that in my article, and I didn't address that with my last answer. So let me kind of tie those together with the drug thing. We have in this country over the last several years, it started in 2013 or 14, a rapid rise in opioid deaths in this country. Last year in 2022, the last year we have data for, there were 107,000 Americans died from opioid overdoses. Now you may think, well, that, you know, that's not warfare. Well, but let's dig into this a little more. Where do these drugs come from? Well, the chemical elements that make up the opioid and fentanyl deaths that we see in the news all the time, a lot of those chemicals come from China. And they come into America through Mexico, through the uh, specifically the Sinaloa and Jalisco New Generation drug cartels are the, are the main culprits. So these killer chemicals are manufactured in China, brought to Mexico, and then come up through our southern border. And that's the spike that we've seen since 2013 in border crossings, many of which are illegal, that are bringing these kind of things into our country. Now, on 9-11, in 19 hijackers, this was a classic uh, fourth generation into fifth generation warfare move. On September 11th, 19 hijackers killed 3,000 Americans. And the result of that was that we spent Probably the estimates I've heard are a couple trillion dollars in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan in the last 20 years because of that. That was as a result of 3,000 Americans being killed in, a, in one day. Well, what about in last year, we had 107,000 Americans killed by these opioid drugs. So my point is this, the Chinese government is deliberately sending these drugs our way because they know that it, the effects it can have and it's undermining and rotting our culture from within. Is that a form of warfare? I contend that it is. So to me, as a ethical idea under just war theory, we would have to say, if you're killing 107,000 of our Americans, we have a moral obligation to not only stop that, but to do it in any, whatever is a reasonable proportional response to that would fit under just war theory. And that's that's where I'm kind of trying to tie those two together. So you also talked about, I mean, you had a whole list of things in addition to the drugs. And one of the things you mentioned was social media. And I put that under things like, you know, and I mentioned too, that there is now warfare that's online, which we would call cyber warfare, where different um, countries are trying to do specific things to undermine other countries, whether it's financial or uh, through business and so forth uh, that we hear about. And so what about that as a form of, of warfare? Because really, cyber warfare probably affects almost every single person, whether it's the stealing of identities and or your credit card was stolen. I mean, all these things are different countries doing some of these 
action. Some of them are individuals, but some of them are also countries too. So how should we think about those things? Because we don't normally think of war, again, in any kind of technological or electronic fashion. Right. And that's that's part of this fifth generation warfare is when I said that we don't realize we're at war. You know, you don't see black helicopters. There's not troops marching through your streets, but you have cyber warfare going on in all the ways you just mentioned. I have a friend here who works for a uh, a company just north of here who underwent a ransomware attack in the summer of 2021. For months, their company couldn't operate several of their, uh, they have conveyor belts. It's a factory that they run. And the, this ransomware took over their business to the point where they had, for several months, they could not operate. They had to pay a ransom. There was, you know, it completely had ripple effect all through the country because this is a big company. I don't know if I'm supposed to mention it. So it was a huge thing. And they ended up having to pay this ransomware. Well, that's not an isolated thing. This is going on all over the place. In addition to, like you talked about, identity theft, financial theft. Then there's spyware. The Russians and Chinese have spyware. In 2023, defense officials found Chinese malware embedded in U.S. military equipment. And in the previous years, they'd found stuff like this, but it was just kind of surveilling and trying to see where we had things, how we operated things. But in early 2023, the New York Times reported that China has uh, determined to penetrate our governments, our companies, and our critical infrastructure with these kind of spyware codes, and that they have the the ability, they're, they're trying to create the ability to cut off power, water, and communications to military bases, personal homes, and businesses across the country. So again, no, there aren't troops marching in the streets. But that is a form of warfare. It's economic. It's hurting our, our nation in ways that we don't even, you can't see it visibly, but it's having a great effect. And then there's things like social media, TikTok. You know, that's become a source of controversy in the government. They're trying to talk about banning TikTok. And the reason is because a kid in China who uses TikTok will get history lessons, science experiments, museum exhibits, patriotic videos. But the same age kid here in the United States will get none of that. They'll get the kind of, uh, I, I want to say garbage, but just kind of mindless entertainment stuff that is introducing all kinds of, uh, in some cases, sexual, in other cases, just morally irresponsible content that our kids are getting. And that's a deliberate move by the Chinese government. The Chinese government controls TikTok. So they use it in their country for a good cause. And in our country, they use it to undermine our culture. Well, and I, I think I was, I was actually going to mention TikTok. And I don't even know if it's that they're doing that because some of the largest TikTok accounts are teenagers in the United States. In other words, followers. So there's a lot of but it's one of the main platforms that most young people use today is TikTok. And in fact, I don't know whatever happened to it. But last year at the end of the year, the Senate passed a bill to ban federal employees. They can't have TikTok on their federal devices. Like if they have a cell phone that they've gotten for use for work from the federal government, they can no longer use that. And I don't know if people realize this, but a lot of the apps that you have on your phone, they, if they're not like well-known apps, so you might hear about a different app that, you know, what whatever it is, oh, help you edit your photos or whatever. You download various different apps and some of those apps, it could be made by U.S. people, it could be made by other people, but they can take the information and data on your smartphone. So I don't know if people realize that that is happening. And a lot of people would say, well, you know, the Chinese government owns TikTok, but I'm just looking at, I don't know, you know, funny memes on it or whatever. But they don't realize that as you do that, I'm not sure that the Chinese government is literally monitoring the phones of you know hundreds of millions of people who might have TikTok in the United States. But it is an app that potentially could have a backdoor to data, which is why the federal government has not allowed their right. at least to use it on their federal government device. Right. Absolutely. And that's why the federal government did that. It was for surveillance and data collection reasons. But my point is this that if you are undermining the culture and the fabric of a society deliberately through the use of morally reprehensible content like that, 
that's a form of warfare. And I think, you know, it's more than just a, you know, I don't want you to steal my data and, and you know, hack my bank account. I don't want you to undermine my culture. So I just think that's an aspect. I'm not saying that's a reason to go to war. I'm saying the combined effect of all these things is a form of warfare. Well, I don't think most of our listeners or most people in the United States or in the West would think of any of these things as particularly associated with warfare. I mean, I think they just think, well, that's just kind of the risks, right? If I have a debit card, it's possible that my debit card will, you know, I'm sure it's happened. Maybe it's there are people it's not happened to, but I'm sure most Americans, the majority of them have had that email that you get and X, Y, Z, and it could be some big, huge, well-known company, but they were data breached. And so if you had purchased something there, then that data was taken for your debit card or whatnot. So how do you fit those kinds of things like drugs or things like cyber warfare or some of these things, like you said, the ransomware where they come and lock down your equipment or that's happened to city governments, by the way, if you yeah. haven't heard about that, they've come in and they've realized because a lot of the websites, there are a little bit more antiquated that they can just lock down and freeze out an entire city government until they pay the ransom to some people who are doing that. But how do you fit this into just war framework work? And how should we think about it? especially some of this fifth generation stuff? I mean, how do, you know, I don't think we're going to go with traditional methods of warfare to fight some of these types of fifth generation tactics. Right. Yeah, I'm not advocating that. I'm, I'm just saying Part of fifth generation warfare is it's a psychological operation. So you can create an atmosphere within a country that is undermines the, everything they stand for. And I, I think that's the moral aspect of this that I'm talking about, that we have to be aware of it. And that when I said that earlier, I, I meant it, that this is a form of warfare that most people, like you just said, most of us don't think, Wait, well, that's not war. Well, isn't it? It's a way to undermine our culture and it has effects both financially and especially with the drugs. Would it be, this is just a hypothetical, I'm not advocating this either, but I'm saying the amount of drugs that are coming into this country that have been directed from the source, from China, for a purpose, would it be ethically under just war theory acceptable to go after the Sinaloa drug cartel in, in uh, Mexico or the factories where they're making this stuff in China. I think that's something that is debatable. And you can't just say, oh, we're going to go do that because obviously the ramifications of that would be huge. So you have to look at the entire scope of just war theory to say, you know, if that was a morally defensible position. All I'm saying is that these types of warfare are going on right in front of our face and most of us are completely unaware that that's what it is. It is a form of warfare. Well, I'm pretty sure that a lot of people, especially when you think about cyber war, feel a little bit like, what can we even do about that? You know, How right? We even and and as a matter of fact, I think there have been instances in the last, I don't know, five or six years of uh, I think there were some things that uh, North Korean military folks did in terms of cyber warfare and U.S. businesses. And it's the news cycle just changes so rapidly, you know, who can keep up with all, all of that. But I, I remember that there was some stuff going down that became very publicly embarrassing for a lot of um, executives in U.S. businesses. And it was traced back to North Korea. But in one sense, are we going to go after? Is our country going to do any kind of tactics, you know, that we would consider warfare against that? You know, North Korea is a very uh, delicate situation. So I, I just think that it's interesting fifth generation warfare just it's hard for a christian to think like how should we think about that in a biblical way because turning the other cheek and those kinds of things were more you know applied to traditional forms of warfare that are still being waged of course as we know as this is november 2023 we see that in gaza we see that in ukraine but the scope is so much larger so you know that brings me to one of the critiques of just war theory, and that is it's been used to rationalize decisions to go 
to war. You mentioned 9-11 and the maybe trillion dollars that were spent and 20 years in Afghanistan that, you know, a lot of people would say was that effective in fighting a different kind of war than we had fought before. So do you think that just war theory is just maybe a philosophical view that has roots in a Christian worldview that you mentioned at the very beginning of this podcast that's really just kind of used to by um, political leaders, governmental leaders who want to engage in warfare because they might fall into the hawkish camp. Right. And it would be uh, intellectually dishonest to say that, you know, everyone is pure as the driven snow about just war theory. Yes, it has been abused by people who uh, in positions of power who want to go to war or or for, for their own financial gain or the gain of their friends. That that has happened. But that doesn't mean we can throw the baby out with the bathwater, I don't think. Just war theory is a moral calculus that we have to use in order to make decisions like that. And I'll just give you some examples. You, you know, the Russian, everyone looks at Russia's attack of Ukraine as an unjust war. And I, I mean, I would have to agree. But if you look at it from the Russian point of view, you know, let's take the situation that Russia had and say that we on our border, which is what Ukraine is on the Russian border, say in our border, the Chinese, the Russians and the North Koreans were setting up a pact, a, you know, a, a mutual treaty between each other and that he started to bring troops and equipment into Mexico or Canada. What would we do? I don't want anyone to misconstrue what I'm saying. I'm not defending Putin. I'm saying to look at this from a just war theory point of view from the Russian side. And you can see that there are ways that people can misuse just war theory to justify or rationalize a decision to go to war like that. On the other hand, when you take what happened on October 7th in Israel, there was nothing just about what Hamas did that day. It was a completely just response for Israel to say, we're going to go after Hamas. And they've been very clear about saying, we're going after Hamas, not the Palestinian people. And they've gone to great measures to try to do that. Obviously, they, civilians have died in, in the Gaza Strip. So it's not a perfect thing. But it's like, you know, people who dismiss Christianity because they've met horrible Christians. I kind of put this in the same kind of place. Don't dismiss just war theory because some people have abused it. Look at what it says. Look at the criteria that it uses. And I think a Christian would be perfectly justified in subscribing to just war theory as an ethical position to take, especially in cases where there's massacre or genocide or something going on where another country, if not our own, needs to be defended. I think there are justifiable reasons to do that. And I think maybe perhaps this has given some further thought to our listeners because we are engaged in a new kind of warfare with this fifth generation because maybe somebody who would have a more traditional pacifist stance in the past, who might not even be you know, on board for what's happening in Israel or was against the U.S. going to strike in the Middle East because of 9-11, let's say there's some people out there like that, and I'm sure there are, they're Christians, I think they should kind of rethink how this all works with fifth generation, because I'm pretty sure there are a lot of Christians who are troubled by the influence of TikTok <laughs> and also would be very troubled if their business suddenly were held for ransom or someone they love visited another country. That's also kind of a thing that's happening with some of the drug cartels is they kidnap Americans to get ransoms and things like that. So some of these other things that are happening that might affect them, like I'm pretty sure people don't want their identity stolen. Right. So maybe it's ways in which to rethink just war theory, because I don't think people would say it's unjust to go after people who are causing harm and financial harm and ruin to people that they were just using their card at the local store and didn't expect that it would get stolen and their identity would get stolen. Right. And, you know, when you say the word war, you think about people shooting and blowing things up and whatever. But this fifth generation warfare has changed that so that, I mean, just because 
we are being attacked in ways that we've ever, ever been attacked psychologically, electronically, doesn't mean we have to go drop bombs on somebody. I'm saying part of just war theory is that a proportional response with the reasonability of success. And just to illustrate that, that I'm on a board that interviews uh, high school kids to go to the service academies for our congressmen. And this year, and during the interviews, I can't, I, there were probably six or seven of the kids we interviewed were applying to the Air Force Academy because the Air Force Academy, apparently, I didn't know this, but is the number one ranked school in the nation for cyber warfare. So we have a whole generation of kids who see warfare completely different than, you know, the, when I was in the Marine Corps 30 years ago. It's a completely different world. And I think as Christians, that the just war theory that I'm talking about is applicable. And we just have to kind of rethink what war actually is nowadays. Well, this has been a very fascinating discussion. I hope we've given our listeners a lot of food for thought. And as I mentioned, you'll be able to read Bob's article for free online at our website, equip.org. And so finally, uh, something a little bit lighter than warfare and even cyber warfare that's good. And holidays are coming up. Thanksgiving's coming up. Christmas is coming up. Bob, what's your favorite side dish or dessert for the holiday? Oh, gosh. Um, side dish would have to be stuffing. I got to have stuffing with my turkey. And my wife makes a couple of pies that I, are my favorite. I, I don't want to I don't want to rank them here, but there's like two or three pies that I just that you have to have on Thanksgiving Day. Well, you're keeping us hanging. We don't know what those pies are, but thank you so much for being a guest again on the Postmodern Realities Podcast. All right, Melanie, thanks for having me. Have a great holiday. You've been listening to episode 367 of the Postmodern Realities Podcast from the Christian Research Journal. Today's guest was Bob Perry, and we had a conversation about just war theory. Bob has written an online feature article for the Christian Research Journal. His article is called just War 5.0 on the evolution and application of Just War Doctrine in the Modern World. You can read his article for free at our website, equip.org. Stay connected with the Christian Research Institute and all the new content we have coming your way. The best way to do that is to head on over to our website, equip.org. There you will find thousands of free resources right at your fingertips, from articles to video to audio and it's all for free. You'll find our podcasts hosted there as well as the Bible Answer Man broadcast, which is hosted by CRI President Hank Canegraaff and streams live every Monday through Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern. In addition, you don't want to miss out on subscribing to Hank Unplugged, which is the podcast of Hank Canegraaff. And in that podcast, he has really in-depth free-flowing, essential Christian conversations with some of the most interesting, informative, and inspirational people. And in addition, he has a new series on his podcast feed called Hank Unplugged Shorts, which Hank goes into the headlines in the mainstream media and refutes a lot of those cultural issues that we have in these short podcast episodes. And there's quite a few of them. You don't want to miss out on them. Now, if you want to find some of this at other places where it's all in one place, really subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's a great way to get all of our content there, our podcasts there, and different individual questions theologically that people have that Hank answers at our YouTube channel. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, I don't know how to subscribe to YouTube. I don't have a YouTube account. Well, actually, you might just have a YouTube account. If you have a Gmail address, you have a YouTube account. Just log into YouTube with your Gmail address and search for Bible Answer Man channel and please become one of our subscribers. In addition, if you see that bell icon right there on our front page, please click that and every time that we have new content, you will receive a notification that new content is up on our channel for you to be able to consume. So thank you so much for the ways in which you partner with the Christian Research Institute. We are grateful for you listening and reading and watching. Thank you.